Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz and we're going to be talking about some murder. Um, if you're new here, I obviously I just said my name is Liz. Duh. Um, <laughs> I am just that person that likes to sit down and talk about murder and educate people on some fucked up shit that has happened. So um, if you're interested, if I piqued your interest, hit that subscribe button, turn your bell notification on to all, and let's jump into today's true crime case, which is that of the murder of Mark Kilroy. We're jumping out of the United States because this crime happened in Mexico. So Mark Kilroy was a student at the University of Texas at Austin. Now, 14th of March of 1989, he was kidnapped in Matamoros, I'm going to say this wrong, to Malipas, I think that's right, Mexico, and he was vacationing there during spring break. Now, he was taken by his abductors to a ranch where he was then tortured and sodomized for hours before being murdered in a human sacrifice ritual. He was killed with a machete blow and then had his brain removed and boiled in a pot. His killers then inserted a wire into his spinal column, amputated his legs at the knees, and buried him at the ranch along with 14 other people who had also been killed there before him. So the leader of the cult that is involved in this, his name is Adolfo Costanzo, told his followers that human sacrifice granted them immunity from law enforcement for their drug smuggling operations. This killing like, was all over media attention, all over it and initiated an international police manhunt because of how unusual this case was. So the bodies were discovered about a month later, so 11th of April of 1989, and Costanzo fled to Mexico City, but eventually he was tracked down. So as police surrounded his apartment complex, Costanzo died after ordering one of the cult members to kill him with a machete, with a machete, with a machine gun. So Sarah Aldrete, and she was a high-ranking member of the cult, was arrested at the scene along with several others. In 1993, the cult members were found guilty of a, a number of different charges, including capital murder, drug trafficking, and several of them. However, they claimed they were not guilty in, with the murder of Mark Kilroy, but they told the press that they were tortured to confess there's two people that still remain at large for this crime. I know I kind of gave you like spoiler. That's what happened, but we're, we're going to dive into it because this case is fucking weird. So Mark Kilroy was born on the 5th of March of 1968 in Chicago. His parents were Jim who Jim Kilroy. He was a chemical engineer and Helen Kilroy. She was a volunteer paramedic. They moved to Texas from the Midwest after he was born. He grew up in Santa Fe, Texas, which is a small town outside of Houston, and for around, he lived there for about 15 years along with his brother, Keith. So he was raised in a Catholic household. His parents were frequent attendants at Our Lady of Lourdes, which is a Catholic church in the adjacent town of Hitchcock. Um, he excelled in academics, in athletics as a teenager. He played baseball, basketball, golf. And he enjoyed being with his friends. He was a part of the Boy Scouts of America, and he was an honor student at Santa Fe High School. He was also a member of student council and was ranked 14th in the class of about 210 people. So that's pretty good. So when he graduated high school in 1986, he then attended Southwest Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. But then he would eventually transfer to Tarleton State University in St Stephenville, Texas. And this was on a basketball scholarship. At Tarleton, he became a member of the Lambda Chi Alpha fraternity, but he decided to give up his athletics. And that's, this is when he transferred to the University of Texas at Austin, where he decided to take a different route and he decided to become pre-med and prepare for his medical college admission test, which is called the MCATs. So now we know a little bit about him. Let's talk about his murderer, shall we? Adolfo Costanzo. So Adolfo Costanzo was a Cuban American and he was born in Miami. 
1962. His father died when he was an infant and his mother relocated to Puerto Rico with him where she would later remarry. So they would return to Florida in 1972 and his stepfather would die soon after moving back there and it would leave a large inheritance for him. His mom then remarried and this time she married a man who was involved in drug trafficking and the occult. So this is where he would get his first like, first like taste of it, if you will. So his stepfather taught him the philosophy behind what he liked to practice. And Costanzo carried this for the rest of his life. He told, he was told that, um, he should let non-believers kill themselves with drugs, um, while he could profit from their foolishness. And around the same time, his mom believed that he had psychic abilities. She then introduced him to Palo Mayombe, which is an Afro-Caribbean religion that involves animal sacrifice. Um, he was also introduced to Santeria when he was younger. He started a Polero, started as a Polero, which is somebody who practices Polo Mayombe and eventually reaches the status of a high priest or a padrino. Um, in 1984, this is when he moves to Mexico City and he starts his life as a tarot card reader and eventually develops a cult following. His charisma, and he was like, he was a very attractive man. He also had previously worked as a male model. That's how attractive this man was. Um, and he claimed that his psychic talent granted him the opportunity to mingle with the upper class in Mexico City. His reputation of predicting the future and offering a ritual cleansing became popular with drug dealers, musicians, and also police officers. So he was, uh, he was reaping the benefits of everything with this. So... The other cult leader in the area, Sarah Aldrete, which we discussed already, she was an honor student and a cheerleader at Texas Southmost College. She was the girlfriend of Gilberto, uh, blah, blah, Gilberto, Gilberto, Gilberto Sosa. Sorry, I don't mean to screw up people's names. Sometimes it's like I'm trying to say the word, but the word vomit doesn't come out. You know what I mean? He was a drug dealer and that was linked to the Hernandez clan, to which Costanzo wanted an introduction. So in 1987, this is when they meet, and they eventually became the cult's main recruiter. Investigators believe that Sarah's physical attractiveness and charm helped her lure men to the cult and help them join the cult and eventually set them up to be abducted and killed. She was like... She recruited people by first showing them a thriller movie that came out in 1987 called The Believers, um, which was about a New York City-based cult that practiced human sacrifice for money and influence. So Adolfo's members were forced to see the film again and again to indoctrinate them to the necessity of human sacrifice, to like fully believe that this is what they needed to do in order to maintain their social existence in, in order to maintain their wealth. Um, so their students and teachers at Sarah's college in Brownsville were called her being friendly, very studious with, um, uh, physical education. And she showed no signs of abnormal behavior or involvement in a religious cult. So across the border, however, in Matamoros, Sarah, was involved in drug smuggling and cult activities. So some of her former classmates found it suspicious that she drove a 1989 vehicle with an embedded telephone, while others recall her being like preferring to dress in all black. Investigators believe that Sarah was living a double life and showed signs of symptoms of having a multi multiple personality disorder. So the ranch where Mark Kilroy was killed in Marimoros, and uh, well, Santa Elena was owned by Brigido, Brigido, Brigido Hernandez. He was not a follower of Adolfo and was not charged with any crimes in U.S. or Mexico. So, yeah, 
The sudden death of Sal Hernandez in a shooting prompted his family, including Elio and his brothers Serafin Sr., Ovidio, to grow closer, closer to rituals and ev eventually become members of Costanzo's cult. Elio reportedly offered Costanzo half of his family's drug proceeds to, in exchange for his criminal contacts and supernatural protection. So a lot of these people feared what Adolfo would do if they didn't seek his protection. So we're going to talk about the spring break trip where Mark was on. And I'm also going to put some, if you've never seen these at, um, I got this at TJ Maxx. This is fantastic. This is Burt's Bees and it's lip balm, but it's a pop socket. Greatest thing ever. Eva. So March 10th, 1989, Mark's childhood friend, Bradley Moore finished his exams at Texas A&M and headed to Austin to pick him up. Both of them then headed to Santa Fe to pick up two other friends, Bill Huddleston and Brent Martin. And they, they picked them up before heading to South Padre Island for spring break. After a foggy nine hour drive to South Texas, they arrived at South Padre Island before midnight. They then checked into the Sheridan's Hotel and Resorts the next morning before heading to the beach. Now, when they arrived at South Padre Island, there were a few people there was just few people there due to the fact that it was very early in the five week spring break season, but thousands of students from the entire U S generally congregate there, um, because it's warm alcohol, all of the above. So there was beer sponsors that were staging a variety of entertainment events, including free movies, music concerts, calls home, surf simulators, all of the above. Um, Mark and Bradley made free phone calls to their parents that day. And later that evening, they met a group of female students from Purdue university and they partied until the next morning. So the following morning, Mark and his friends had more or less a daily routine in mind. They went to the beach, got suntanned before lunch. After lunch, they went to back to the beach area behind their hotel for the daily Miss Tanline contest. So they could, you know, check out the ladies you know, manly things. <laughs> um, once the event was over for the afternoon, Mark then would head to the hotel for a quick nap before they planned their trip to Mexico. Um, they then left South Padre Island and stopped for dinner at a Sonic in Port Isabel, Texas, where they met a group of female friends or female students from the University of Kansas who are planning to party in Mexico as well. So the women then followed Bradley's car from Port Isabel to Brownsville and parked their cars close to the Ghetto Gateway International Bridge before crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. So Mark and his friends and the Kansas women spent most of their evening at the Sergeant Pepper's nightclub in Matamoros before the group went their separate ways. Mark and his friends returned to South Padre Island early the next morning. So on the 13th of March, Mark and his friends then attended another Miss Tanline contest behind the Sheridan. And early in the evening, Mark met one of his former frat brothers at a condo party. This is about 10.30 p.m. Mark and his friends left said party and headed back to Matimoros. They parked on the border and crossed by foot again. So that night, Matimoros was flooded with about 15,000 tourists from U.S., and along the main street, which the main street is called Alvaro Obregan. So, oh, Obregan. Yeah, Alvaro Obregan. Sounds about, sounds right. So the sidewalks, the streets, and nightclubs were packed with foreign tourists, and they were looking to enjoy a night with cheap alcohol and enjoy the <laughs> very, very relaxed laws that Mexico has. So when they got to Matimoros, Mark and his friends decided to go to a bar that had the shortest waiting line. They ended up at Los Sombreros, which is a bar with rock music and bright neon lights. So after about a few drinks, they left this bar and they went to the London pub, which rebranded itself as Hard Rock Cafe for spring break. This bar was louder and wilder than the last, and his friends stood at the bar while other tourists threw beer from the balcony. 
This is when Mark met a few women at the bar and was not seen by his friends for a while. At around 2 a.m., Bradley suggested that the group head back to South Padre Island as his friend stepped out of London Pub. And this is when they saw Mark leaning against a car talking to a woman from his tan line. Across the street, thousands of tourists are leaving the bars and they're heading back to Brownsville. So all of them are doing the same thing. But others moved in different directions. The large crowd made it difficult for them to see where Mark was going. And they, the friends ended up walking across and uninterrupted, like the border, uninterrupted in a group. So, Brent, ooh, sorry, Bradley and Brent separated from the group and walked to Garcia's, which was a popular restaurant store-ish thing close to the border. Mark stopped at the steps of a house on the street to say goodbye to the woman from his tan line. He then waited for Bradley to walk towards him. Bradley then ran to a nearby alley to pee while Mark waited for him. Um, and by the time he came out and caught up with the other two at Garcia's, Mark wasn't there. So his friends searched for him and waited for him, but they didn't see anything. And by the time the streets cleared up at about 4.30 a.m., they decided to cross the border, thinking that maybe Mark had already crossed the border and were perhaps waiting at the parked car. But when they got to the car, they didn't find him. A few minutes in, like Brownsville, they returned to South Padre Island. And they thought that maybe Mark probably left the hotel with somebody. They woke up the next day and Mark still wasn't there. So this is when they contacted the police and they filed a missing persons report. So it's believed that as Mark was standing on the street, he was lured by a man parked inside of a red truck who apparently called him and asked him if he needed a ride. And as he got close to the vehicle, he was then grabbed by two men. And these two men are Serafine, Serafin Hernandez Garcia and Malio Fab, Fabio Ponce Torres. And they had wrestled him inside the truck. Because of his size and athletic strength, Mark was able to break loose about two blocks down the road this is when they stopped for a few minutes and stopped for a few moments. Mark ran from the truck, but eventually was intercepted by another vehicle driven by allies. And he was taken at gunpoint. He was then subdued and handcuffed in the back of the second car. So this is when they drove the back streets of the city past an industrial area. And they drove past a number of bars and vendor stands to thin out like Basically, they were trying to evade people seeing them with him. They then took a dirt road that stretched down to cornfields. And when they got to the private ranch known as Santa Elena, um, they left Mark inside the car overnight. Shortly after dawn, the caretaker of the ranch went to see Mark. They fed him bread, eggs, and water. About 12 hours after he was kidnapped, though, Costanzo and his men came to see Mark. They then wrapped his face in duct tape and walked him through a field to a storage cabin. This is where they held him with his hands tied around his back. Throughout the night, he would be tortured and sodomized. He was then led out to the field where Costanzo killed him by chopping the back of his neck and his head with a machete. His brain was then boiled in a ninganga, which is an African metal pot that Costanzo used to stew human and animal remains. His legs were chopped above the knee to facilitate his burial. A wire was inserted in his spinal cord to pull the bones out once his body decomposed. The cult members then dug a hole on the ground and buried his corpse. So the search for him began a routine missing persons investigation. Students reported um, students were reported missing all the time in Mighty Moros and would often turn up follow, like a few days following with a hangover and a blurry memory about what happened. So, however, this case drew more of a ten an intention in the United States because of his uncle, Ken Kilroy. Now, Ken Kilroy worked 
in customs in Los Angeles. And when news reached his uncle, the police task force was created in Brownsville to search for Mark. And it suggested that Mark had disappeared in Brownsville, but his friends denied these claims. So the Mexican Federal Police Force vowed to work with the United States with this investigation. And one of the commanders assigned to work with the Mexican agents um, in the U.S. officials accompanied them. Like they all, they all went down together to Mati Moros. And together they questioned informants, potential witnesses, and worked on tips provided by their sources. So they suspected that his disappearance had foul play. And they speculated that Mark could have been the victim of a drug-related violence or of a robbery killing. But they were short on leads to confirm this. And when Mark's friends reported the disappearance, customs agents went, then went to with them to Marty Morris jails and hospitals. Investigators hired a hypnotist um, to see if they could figure out any other clues. And under hypnosis, this is when... Bradley stated that he saw a young Hispanic man with a blue plaid shirt and a visible scar across his face talking to Mark before he disappeared. He recalled the man walking up to Mark and told him, hey, don't I know you from somewhere? Though, though Bradley said he wasn't sure if Mark responded back. However, none of the friends were precisely able to recall the exact moment when Mark disappeared. So this is when investigators think that the store, like, think that Mark was kidnapped for robbery or ransom. So the first option was most likely because his abductors had not called for a payment they believed that Mark's body was probably dumped in a remote location. So helicopters and terrain vehicles were used by the U.S. Border Patrol and were called to look out at the Rio Grande River, but his, video, his body was not discovered there. So during the investigation, Mark's parents headed to Rio Grande Valley and circulated more than 20,000 handouts throughout the region and offered a $15,000 reward to help locate their son. So Texas officials told Mark's parents they were planning to talk to Tamaulipas Governor Americo Villarreal Guerrera, or Guerra, Guerra, um, and get people um, from Mari Morris more involved in this case. So people from Mark's hometown traveled to Mari Morris and issued flyers off, like offering the reward to anybody that could provide any information. So and to help allude to his safe return to his parents. So U.S. authorities praised the efforts of the Mexican federal, federal police on this case, but they distrusted the state and municipal officials. They suspected that because state and local authorities were acting so slowly and not sharing enough information, that Mark's murderers had insiders within the ranks, which is true. I mean, it is true, like I had already previously mentioned. Um, on the 26th of March, the case was highlighted on national television on America's Most Wanted. This gave the case national attention and generated several phone calls and letters with people giving clues about Mark's whereabouts. However, none of these leads generated a solid enough, like, pursuant in this case. A few days later, Mark's parents returned to Santa Fe. Santa Fe residents raised money through garage sales and car washes to help Mark's parents continue their search. They then went to the University of Texas to withdraw their son from school. Uh, 1st of April of 1989, the state authorities did a routine checkpoint near Santa Elena, and they saw a vehicle that ran through the checkpoint without stopping. So the vehicle then crossed the international border from Texas and sped through the Mexican Federal Highway, which connects Marimoros and Reynosa to Mulipas. The man driving the vehicle was Serafin, and this is the man that kidnapped Mark a few, few weeks earlier. So instead of turning their police sirens on, the police decided to just follow the truck in an unmarked car. This is when they were led to the ranch and pulled off in the distance. After about 30 minutes, Serafin re took off 
from the ranch and headed back to the city. So this is when they decided to make their move on the ranch. So in a quick search, this is when they found cult paraphernalia and traces of marijuana. So instead of arresting Seraphin, they decided to continue gathering evidence based on the suspected criminal activities at the ranch and organized crime members involved with the Hernandez family. They used informant informants in Monte Morris to inquire on family activities at Santa Elena in order to make sure like they could make these crucial arrests. So the 9th of April, they returned with several other officers, arrested Serafin, his uncle Elio, and cult members David Valdez and Sergio Salinas in Domingo Bustamante, which is the ranch's caretaker. So while in custody, they were super relaxed. They were sent to a prison while police interrogated the caretaker at the ranch. This person then revealed that the ranch had frequent visitors from Serafin's criminal group. The ranch's caretaker identified Mark through a photograph and stated that he saw him at the ranch. He said, yeah, I saw him, and then pointed to the shack at the ranch. So police decided to investigate Serafin separately. He confessed to aiding in Mark's murder and the other people that were killed over the period of several months at the ranch. Serafin then identified Costanzo and Adrete as the heads of the group, and he said that Costanzo ordered the slayings as part of a ritualistic sacrifice and believed that sacrificing his victims do, were those doing the sacrifice were ensured strength, abundance, and immunity from law enforcement and injury. Specifically, he said that Mark was chosen at random because Costanzo had ordered him to find a white Anglo-Saxon man or a gringo to sacrifice. He said that Mark was killed by Costanzo by a machete blow and his body was buried at the ranch. So Serafin then agreed to take them to the exact spot where he was buried, and then, which was marked by wire coming out of the dirt. He stated that the wire was attached to his spinal cord so that they could pull out the bones and wear them as necklaces as his body decomposed. So the 11th of April, the police took Serafin and the four other suspects to the ranch and asked them to show them where Mark's remains were and the others. That afternoon, they were first they were forced at gunpoint to dig up these graves, which I commend these cops for doing that. That's some smart shit right there. So once Mark's body was exhumed, the police observed that his legs were missing. And this is when it was explained that the amputations were not a procedure of ritual, but were done to simplify burial. So after the excavation concluded, there was 15 sets of mutilated remains, including Mark's, all males who had been killed over a period of nine months. Mark's corpse was officially identified after Brownsville police matched his dental records with teeth found at the crime scene. So the investigators concluded that most of the victims were rival drug dealers of Costanzo's and not random sacrificial victims. Three out of the 15 bodies have never been identified. They also seized uh, 110 kilograms of marijuana, and that e like equals out to 243 pounds of marijuana. 108 grams of cocaine, 12 firearms, including a submachine gun, oh, three submachine guns, 11 vehicles, some equipped with telephones. And also inside, they found an iron pot, the Ninganga, um, in which they discovered parts of a human brain, a goat's head, chicken feet, a turtle, several herbs, a horseshoe, coins mixed with animal blood. And they found no signs of cannibalism. Interesting, right? So the 12th of April, the detainees were taken to headquarters um, for a press conference. More than 250 journalists arrived at the scene to take pictures and question them. They were then paraded, at about, uh, paraded around the building's balcony and were allowed to answer questions for reporters. This part, I, this I don't make, I don't understand. So, as the camera zoomed in, Elio showed off his membership scars on his shoulders, his back, his arms, and his chest. They were arrow-like cuts made with a hot blade, and these marks were given to select cult members with the authority to perform human sacrifice. 
So there was a religious ceremony initially intended to revive hope for Mark's safety. Um, but it eventually was commuted to a memorial service. And this was on the 13th of April after his body was discovered. So this was held at the church that his family went to our lady of Lords Catholic church in Santa Fe. And this, they then many local residents attended this and about 150 children pinned yellow ribbons outside the church's trees to rally in favor of Mark. After the ceremony, Mark's friends stated that they wished they stayed in Texas instead of partying in Mexico. Um, at St. Luke's Catholic Church in Brownsville, there were about 1,200 people that attended the memorial service to support his parents. Several of the attendees wore the yellow ribbons with Miss You Mark written on them, and they waited in line at the service to express their condolences to his parents. His family showed deep, like, deep faith and conviction while speaking to the press. His father spoke about the murder and told the press that he wasn't angry. They weren't angry with the killers. He hoped that if when those responsible for Mark's death to go to heaven to see their son, that they could apologize to him for their wrongdoing. And Mark's mom told others to pray for the murderers. I have, I, I understand if you are that deep rooted in your religious beliefs to be able to say stuff like that, but I'm sorry. I would never be able to do that. You hurt my babies. I want to murder you or I want to see you die. End of discussion. Yeah. So, um, on the 15th of April, Mark's parents met with George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, who was the president at the time, and William Bennett, who edited the Office of National Drug Count, uh, National Drug Control Policy. They told the politicians that for every drug consumer, there is a victim who suffers from addiction. In addition, he stated that drug consumption should be treated with better education than that of use of drugs, even casually causes suffering. Bush then described this case as very sensitive, and Bennett stated that Mark's murder was more national, uh, nationally and nationwide, but his parents, but that the parents were able to turn their suffering into a very good effort, which I mean that's nice, that's good of them to do. So after meeting them, his parents stated that although Bush and Bennett were not specific on their ash, their actions for their during their administration, um to take fight against drugs and enforce it local state and federal level. They were satisfied that the government was looking in the right direction, which it still hasn't looked in the right direction. There needs to be a massive drug reform in this country. And we need to get rid of all of the new Ham like all of the liquor outlets that are everywhere. Having, having this stuff so readily available does not help anybody. And the pharma issue in this country is nonsense. It's absolute hogwash. Stop upselling things that people need. I digress. <sighs> so two weeks after the bodies were exhumed, Mexican federal police returned to the ranch in the early morning to burn down the shack and lay a wooden cross above the ashes. So reportedly the police took a querendano, a querendano there, Kirandero, Kirandero, um, or folk healer, to purify the shack before burning it down. Uh, the Kirandero went inside the house and said a few prayers, sprinkled the floor with salt, and concluded by making the sign of a cross. They then sprayed gasoline around the shack before setting it on fire. So they offered no official explanation for their actions, but a source close to the investigation stated that the police's motives were super supernatural in nature. They said that they knew the shack meant a lot to Costanzo and burning it down would make him go insane and that they would hit a nerve with him. The next morning, they were right. He went into a rage and this was shown. It This happened after the arson was shown on national TV. So he went absolute ape shit. So the manhunt for these men happened thereafter. Um... By murdering Mark, this was the downfall of Costanzo's cult. 
he attracted international attention and forced the Mexican government to focus their efforts on bringing him into justice. So on the 11th of April, the day the bodies were exhumed, he fled to a Holiday Inn in Brownsville before fleeing then again to McAllen, Texas, to Mexico City, where he had an apartment. He escaped with Sarah, um, Sarah Aldrete, the other high official in the cult, along with Martin Rodriguez, Omar Orea Ochoa, and Alvaro de Leon Valdez. Um, so the U.S. and Mexican law enforcement agencies carried out the manhunt to locate them. Police believed that he fled to Miami to visit his mom, but then opted to go to Mexico City, and where he hid with several of his followers for periods of time. So rumors that he resurfaced in Chicago were also going around and also suggested that Sarah was spotted throughout the Rio Grande Valley um, and that she vowed to kidnap children for every jailed cult member. A convenience store worker in Clovis, New Mexico, called the police and told them that he's seen a couple matching the description of Sarah and Adolfo shopping well, stopping at his store to purchase something. And according to investigators, he was last seen driving in 1989 Mercedes-Benz in Brownsville. So, Muddy Moros, in Muddy Moros, the officials raided Sarah's house. They discovered an altar, several religious images. They also stated that the house was covered in blood. Covered. In Cameron County, um, Sheriff's Office in Texas, authorities released a wanted poster of Adolfo stating that he was extremely dangerous and indicted him and Sarah uh, for aggravated kidnapping. They were also indicted by the state jury in McAllen, along with 11 other cult members of Costanza's organization for importing, importing marijuana conspiracy to import marijuana conspiracy to possess an, in an intent of distributing and possession of intent of distributing. So the Cameron County officials also issued arrest warrants for the other cult members that were at large, although none of the leads pro proved to be successful, but police encouraged local citizens to help them. So Seraphin was arrested on the 17th of April, and he was arrested in Houston by the DEA and Texas Department of Public Safety. So federal charges were filed against him for importing marijuana, possession, and conspiracy. Two other men implicated with him were Quintana Rodriguez and Ponce Torres, both were Mexican citizens. As the police searched this Houston house, they seized cash and weapons, but found no evidence of cult paraphernalia and or any leads pointing to Adolfo. So they believe that they believed that Adolfo was hiding in Houston because he was linked to a twenty million dollar failed cocaine operation that was busted in June of nineteen eighty eight. So when the house was raided, they found ritualistic candles and an altar and paperwork with Rivera's name on it. Police believed that Adolfo brought bought several properties across Houston in the past and were investigating if he had visited any of his alleged hangouts. Seraphin cooperated with the U.S. officials and was sentenced to 18 months in prison. He was released in 1990 and he then returned to Brownsville. So, the 17th of April in Mexico City, the police raid another one of his properties, another one of Adolfo's properties in Atizapan. They discovered piles of homosexual pornography in a hidden ritual chamber with an altar. This prompted police to question people in the city of uh, specifically the homosexual community, to see if they had any leads on Adolfo's whereabouts. The police stated that they had no evidence found at the scene to link Adolfo to his, to, or his men to any murders committed here. And they, that they said when they saw the altars and other ritualistic belongings, they didn't find any traces of blood. No men were arrested at the, at the scene, but police managed to arrest a lady called Maria Teresa Quintana. Rodriguez, which is the sister of one of Adolfo's lovers and henchmen. So the police also discovered that Sarah's purse and other belongings were left behind, which prompted them to conclude that Adolfo probably murdered her because she knew too much in the inner workings of the cult. 
but they were wrong. Police then stated that they did not see her in the group when they arrived in Mexico City. So on the 24th of April, police then arrested Victor Manuel Antunez Flores and Salvador Ant Antonio Villaluz, and they were hiding in one of Adolfo's properties in the Juarez neighborhood. So they noticed that the killings in Marimoros were similar to the murders carried out in Mexico City. Then these murders happened between 87 and 89. After consulting with local uh, witch pra practi practitioners and sorcerers, police then headed to Adolfo. Police heard that Adolfo was probably heading out in, oh, this is going to be a fun one to say. Oh, man. So, okay, the place that they were is named after a former Aztec leader, Cuauhtémoc, uh, Cuauhtémoc, Cuauhtémoc, we'll say that. And it's one of the 16 boroughs of Mexico City, and it's one of the oldest parts of the city. Um, so they had another contact that told them of an address of interest in Veronica Azura's neighborhood next to Cuauhtémoc. Um, and the police then sent 16 officers there. And this is where they interrogated a shoemaker at a supermarket who claimed to see a woman matching Sarah's description. The police then spotted a man at the supermarket who was attempting to buy a large amount of groceries with U.S. dollars. They followed the man, seeing that he lived in an apartment in Rio Sena. Um, and by the end of the week, they concluded that this man was De Leon and he was buying groceries for Adolfo. On the 6th of May of 1989, this is when police surround the building and waited for traffic to subside before raiding it. However, a black vehicle pulled up in front of the apartment complex and police walked over to investigate. This is when Adolfo noticed the police from the window of his apartment and opened fire on the officers on the ground level. He then threw golden coins and paper money out the window and burned some of his money on the stove. He ran out of ammunition and began to lose his patience. After about 45 minutes, he ordered De Leon to kill him in Quintana Rodriguez. So, basically, he had his buddy kill him. Yeah. So, at the scene, this is when they took Sarah De Leon, Orea Ocho, Juan Carlos Fregosa, and Jorge Montes into custody. Police then arrest Maria de Lourdes. Uh, Guero Lopez and Maria del Rocio Cuevas Guerra and other cultists under Adolfo in Mexico City late, like later that day. So same day they arrest all these people. They were renting out one of Adolfo's apartments. And the individuals arrested were held for homicide, criminal association, wounding an officer and damaging the property. They feared that Adolfo faked his death and investigators conducted fingerprint analysis on the body that they found, and they concluded that it was Adolfo. So there was a 9mm Uzi submachine gun in his supposed suitcase that were never formally presented by the police as seized items. So on the 15th of May, a judge refused to set bail for the individuals arrested that day because they were wanted for crimes accumulating over 50 years in prison. So... 27th of August of 1989, um, Aurea Ochoa, Ochoa was admitted to the hospital after being diagnosed with AIDS. Um, the police said that he and Sarah were Adolfo's lovers, although Sarah never showed signs of the disease in her immune system. He died on the 11th of February of 1990. So 2nd of June of 1989, Salvador... Um, Vidal Garcia Alceron, um, he was the police chief of the Federal Judicial Police. He was indicted for drug trafficking. He was linked to Adolfo by Sarah and other cult members. Um, in August 1990, De Leon was sentenced to 30 years in prison for killing Adolfo in Quintana Rodriguez. Um, for Grossa and Montes were convicted of separate murder charges and sentenced to 35 years in prison. 
Reyes Bustamante, the ranch caretaker, was accused in court of a cover-up. He was released from prison on the 11th of December of 1990 after he paid a U.S. bond of $500. So, in on the 10th of June of 1993, um, the drug trafficking charges against Ovidio in Ponce Torres was dropped in the U.S. without a stated reason. Sarah, on the 3rd of May of 1994, was sentenced to 62 years in prison. The other cult members, Elio Serafin Jr., Martinez Salinas, and Serna Valdez, each received 67 years. In an interview with the press, Mark's parents stated that they were relieved to hear that the cult cultists were sentenced. They were charged with multiple murders, possessions of narcotics involvement in organized crime, police impersonation, illegal body desecration, illegal possession of firearms, and illegal possession of weapons exclusion ex exclusive to Mexican armed forces. So the judge, the federal judge that presided over this in Mexico explained that the reason that Sarah received fewer years in prison than the rest was because she was not charged with using any weapons that were military exclusive, which carried out a five year maximum sentence. He also stated that the maximum conviction a person in Mexico could receive for capital punishment, capital murder was 50 years. So, all of them were sentenced to time in prison. There, as of 2009, two suspects remain at large, and this was Ovidio and Ponce Torres, and were wanted for Mark's murder. Now, they were sentenced, that they were the ones that had their charges dropped for no valid reason. But... That, my friends, is the murder of Mark Kilroy. I know that was a fun one, and this is a very long video. So I hope you guys enjoyed this tragic and wild and crazy case. And I'll see you guys tomorrow in another video. Bye, guys.